they don't get a big bomb, they don't get a big year, and the store is very quickly. So I think the iron store went up very, very, very quickly. Traditionally, we've given iron store cut cereal, uh, rice cereal, because it's a new pathogenic, and meat is a new, a new player on the block. And where meat came from was a colleague of mine in Denver, in a study looking at zinc mutations in poker uh, mittens, fancy crepes. And she found that you were much more likely to get meat for zinc beans if you gave meat rather than cereal. That was fine for zinc. The study was powerful with zinc, not an iron. But the American Academy jumped on it and used it to push iron in beef as a rather available source. And here's uh, basically what the recommendation for Health Canada looks like. Recommend meat, meat alternatives, and not work by cereal. My objective at the time was why is meat <coughs> this, this, this has tremendous influence because if a mother or a public health nutritionist uh, looks at this guideline, they see meat first. Now, every night over this room is the full meat, less meat, and not that you avoid certain types of meat, particularly processed meat. So I said to the lady, well, why are we aggressively engaging meat? First, that we're telling each other to stop eating meat and cut it down and avoid eating both food and vegetables and less plants and all that. All the things that you know. Why are we doing this? Why don't we engage people first? No good answer. Uh, still no good answer. Uh, mothers have sort of taken things into their own hands, which they always do. And the meat consumption in Canada for infants is not very high, according to the data. Uh, the most recent community health survey. Did not address that issue, so we're not quite sure where meat is a first group of baby span. But that's the recommendation, meat is first. <coughs> this is a survey we did uh, out of here when I first came here, it's about 10 years old. Uh, these are food, different foods uh, in the first year of life, so we have every month of food. Oh, okay. The screen is smart. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. 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 And you can see it every month, this is a proportion of these, this, this was uh, 2,000 just across Canada. This was truly a national survey. Uh, and what is it you're eating? And you can see that meat doesn't start creeping up to about here. <laughs> All right, meat doesn't start creeping up to about there. Um, and it's still basically pretty much like that. And this followed the guidelines. So cereals first, fruits and vegetables next. And uh, this was in 2003, 2004. Where it stands now, uh, we, we have a lot of problems with Health Canada. We don't know where it stands. We're not sure what people are doing. So we said, OK. He said, I'm off your committee. Give me some money. So I'm going to decide to prove you wrong. That's how it happened. But it was, it was dramatic at the time. So here, <coughs> we took three groups of babies, all breastfed. Exclusively breastfed, they have to be exclusively breastfed. And mothers had to be given the food and the new ones at the on time, which was six months. Now, I knew mothers were going to wait for six months, but nobody does. About four and a half months. That's when women start being solid. And if you look at the data, that's probably, well, my bias is that's probably too well there. A prescription for all babies to breastfeed exclusively to six months of age is a prescription. And it is only meant to be a population. Not some babies need food earlier, some babies need food later. But, I'll be a good boy. <laughs> These are the three foods we share, three groups of babies. Uh, we didn't pick any brand, we got no support from any of the companies. We wanted rice cereal, rice cereal plus fruit, and meat. The reason we wanted rice cereal plus fruit is because I hypothesized that the fruit would help the baby, that it would produce free radical. Uh, uh, generation that we got. That's why we did it. I'll give you a little more detail. Randomized clinical trial is finished. Uh, the 
slide is out of date. The sign is up to date. 30 days of today's group, that's what we're aiming for. We started in 2013. Uh, our hypotheses were that if you consumed iron fortified red cereals as a first food, that there would be uh, reactive oxygen species generated in the gut, and this would induce inflammation. Red cereals are fruit which counteract that because fruit is great antioxidant, as you know, as we all know. Consumption of meat will not gener generate ROS, reactive oxygen species, and all foods will have the microbiome. So I was just coming to understand what the microbiome. I was fortunate enough to uh, see Megan at a conference and we uh, teamed up to took the data. Um, but it's really cool, microbiome, you know. And, you know, it's cool. And it's also very important because there's all sorts of things going on. We don't have to We are basically walking to be this microbiome. So be very afraid. <laughs> Sometimes. Anyway. So I thought this is great because we got babies who are exclusively breastfeeding and then we feed them different foods and what happened. It's not happening. No? Yeah. So uh, I guess we'll see. So here's how it looks. This is when mother died. Here's our, uh, here's our timeline. Um, here's our timeline. And we wanted we wanted mothers to go six months in and do solid, but they really didn't. They started about four and a half months. As soon as they started, we told them to feed our food, they randomized to our food, and uh, we would collect it usually about three weeks later. That's enough time to also the microbiome. And enough time, well, you see. So there's the timeline. Exclusively, mostly, eats the mother crops, and I want to get my baby solid now, we'll see it right over, we bring her, her out, free food, uh, she feeds that. There's a design, and what we're looking at were isoprostate, so there's a real prostatation. So I wanted to see if there was systemic oxidation of these babies. Uh, fecal cow protection, that's a novel test. You know, one company in Germany makes it. It measures intestinal inflammation. It's one of the, one of the tests to do that. Uh, non demyer generation. Um, a reactive oxygen species. The problem with cereal is that most of the iron in the cereal is not absorbed. So it used to be that in Canada, infant rice cereal, any, any, any baby cereal had 100 milligrams of iron per 100 grams of cereal, which was a lot. <coughs> but babies needed iron, so okay. It's now down to 30. They don't, I'm not sure why it's a pound They don't need 100. Of the 30 milligrams of iron per 100 grams of cereal, most of it will be unabsorbed, like 90%. And that iron goes to the colon, which sits in the colon. And my God, save us all. That's the last place you want to be generated in sitting in the colon. Iron is an incredible free radical Initiated. Um, it's a, it's a absolutely essential. I just don't know why I use it, but it's absolutely the window of good is about that big, and window of bad is about that big. If you get too little, you get way too much, like people from the post. So I thought, you know, it's probably not a good idea to have this iron city and we got a newborn. So we measured the iron in the stool and we did uh, microbiome. And uh, reactive oxygen species, there's a whole bunch of them. They, they're good, they're self-signaler, they, they're essential for life in homeostasis. If you have any uh, disease or are vulnerable in any way, you can be overwhelmed by free radicals in many different ways. Every disease that we know of has some free radical mechanism so this is some of the more common ones. All right, so here's our study group. Uh, three groups, cereal, cereal fruit, and meat. And they're, they're the uh, uh, characteristics, the baseline characteristics of our group. 
there is no difference in any of the characteristics uh, except for maternal age. The mothers in the D group were a little older. I was totally uh, uh, randomized, but okay, no it wasn't, because there were several mothers who when they were told they were going to be dropped out of the study. So maybe that bias the selective procedure to older women. So older women are more likely to be me. I'm not sure. But anyway, this one here. This one here. Maternal age was different. Uh, does that affect our results? No. No difference in urinary isoprostine. So isoprostine is the gold standard for lipid oxidation. It's a breakdown product, product of arachidonic acid, long chain PUFA. And there was no difference in the three groups. This is measured in urine by a colleague of mine in Nashville who invented the method of this world expert. And that's good. Fecal iron, well, uh, you, uh, the two groups on the right are cereal plus fruit, cereal in the middle, meat on the end. Uh, there was a difference in fecal iron before and after breastfeeding in the cereal group. Of course there was. Whatever cereal ate, which averaged about 50 grams a day, um, most of the iron there was about 70 milligrams. Most of it was unabsorbed when into their stool. We know that. The meat group, most of the iron in the meat gets absorbed. It's heat iron. Just wax across the gut, no problem. Nothing sitting in the cold. And you can see that. So blue is uh, stools while breastfeeding, red is stools after feeding solid food. So fecal iron goes up. Okay. So we expect. Uh, here's a, uh, another chart that shows the difference between fecal iron while breastfeeding and fecal iron after solids. And you can see, this is neat on the far right, you can see that the differences are, are, are small. And that's because there's no iron. There's no iron in the breast milk and there's virtually no iron left on absorbing meat. So there's no difference between the two before and after. And that's what that chart shows. So now we know cereal, cereal plus fruit and more iron in the stool. Is chemistry is a skip. I put that in. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, reactive oxygen species. So it's the same kind of graph as before. Here's the measurements on the left. The meat group is first, the syrup group is second, the syrup is the third. In both cases, there were more. There was more effect of the iron in the cereal fed babies. So this test is a measure of the ability of the gut to resist oxidative stress. That's what this test is. It's an in vitro uh, test. And our conclusion is, is that the babies fed iron fortified cereal are less able to resist oxidative stress than the babies fed meat. And there's no, there's a fruit in the health. No difference in the fruit. So if you have a healthy um, newborn, breastfed, Everything is going good. Uh, everything will go good. Babies are very plastic. If you have an infant that's at risk in some fashion, either by birth uh, or by history, um, they will be at risk in this situation. And you know, the mortality rate is, is, is high in the first year of life and drops. Um, so, you know, congratulations to all of us who made it this far. You know, that's really a major accomplishment. You sometimes take it for granted, don't. So, more reactive, less than the ability to resist oxidative stress in serial fed groups. Now, this was a bit of a surprise, which is great, but I love surprises. You have all these hypotheses, you do your study, you get exactly what you turned out. What does that mean? probably designed it to turn it out exactly what he wanted to turn it out. But in this case, there was inflammation in the gut of the baby's getting food. We didn't expect this. I expected there would be less inflammation. But this calvertectin is a marker, a fecal marker of, of, of inflammation, and it was higher in food food. And I remember when I was designing the study, my colleagues, one of my colleagues, Noel Solomon, who's a 
with a lot of this sort of stuff, said, you can't eat fruit. Well, what are you doing? You're, you're allergic to fruit. Why are you eating fruit so early? Don't eat fruit. Don't eat fruit. And of course, I thought about it for, it must have been a minute at least. <laughs> and forgot it and totally ignored it. And in fact, when I looked back and said, you were right, you were right. Why did you say don't eat fruit? He didn't ask me. It was too bad. <laughs> But anyways, there's more inflammation in the gut other than just getting food. <laughs> now, is it the fruit? Is it the, is it, I look at the label, we're, we're, we're running it down. Is it the sulfites? Is it the preservatives? Is it, is it what? We don't know. Maybe it's the fruit, maybe it's not. I don't know. In this particular feeding group, at this particular time, this is what we got. Uh, you know, if you have any ideas, I'd be glad to hear so far, nobody's given a good idea. It's totally counterintuitive. There should be less inflammation in a fruit-based cereal because fruit is a powerful antioxidant, and we know how important antioxidants are. So I'll let you think about that. Oh, coffee time. <laughs> I showed this slide at uh, EB, and uh, people are all excited. I said, you know, I don't know what it means. And my students made me promise I wouldn't say anything. So I didn't. Uh, and this time, because I'm, you know, 66 years of age, I've developed some wisdom. I asked somebody who knows what they're talking about to talk about. So I'm making it as that. Please come forward. Please explain the rest. So uh, James mentioned we met at this meeting he's describing in uh, San Diego earlier this year and I was presenting his trial. I mentioned that they were doing microbiome, but he was not going to talk about it today because he didn't know what it all meant. So I sort of approached him after we and we got to chatting. Um, and it was really good timing because I was starting here at Mitch this summer. So I've been doing a little bit of um, data analysis on his microbiome data. Uh, and so it's a really neat question to ask what happens to the gut microbiome when they eat work that right? So we're still sort of early in the analysis, um, and to be honest, I'm kind of surprised at the so far differences I'm not finding, but um, the data are the data. So this is showing you uh, the three groups that Jason described. Um, the first three are before introduction of foods and then after. So you can see that actually before, just by random chance, there are some differences, in particular the orange group, which is factor D, was a bit higher before in the cereal group, and that's important to know because if you just look at the after, you think, oh, it's higher in cereal. Um, but you have to do some work in terms of adjusting for the baseline differences to see if, if any of these are really diet related. But I can tell you that when you do stats on this um, and look at the three groups, nothing is significantly different. Um, but there might be some patterns. And we've kind of cut this a few different ways and we'll show you that. So one difference that we do see um, between the three feeding groups is in terms of, so here we're looking at each color in a different group of bacteria. Um, but it's really looking at the microbiome is to say, um, rather than looking at specific groups, just to get an overall big picture of the diversity of the microbiome. Um, and so that's what we looked at here. So in each sample, we assign a diversity score, which encompasses all the bacteria present and the relative proportions that are present in. Um, and what we saw is that after feeding, so the, the graphs are showing change. Um, and these are two different scores. We used one that's called the Shannon Diversity Index, and one is the Child Bone Richness Score. Um, and they're showing you change. So the dotted line is zero, meaning no change. So in the serial group, um, we see the average is no change. There's a bit of spread in each dot is one infant. But the average is really no change from before um, foods to after, so breastfeeding to after. There wasn't a touch. <laughs> the average is no change. Whereas in the serial plus fruit, and even more so in the meat, there was this average increase in diversity. Um, and that was statistically significant. So here I'm showing each infant and an average. Um, in the table, it shows uh, the fold difference. So in the serial group, in these two different measures, the fold increase is 5%, and it's not a significant increase. Whereas in the serial meat, it's you know about 20%, um, or 29% increase. So that's sort of a clue that something different is going on in the microbiome. Um, but it doesn't tell us specifically which organisms are contributing to that difference. So that's what we're trying to nail down, but it does look like a difference in the microbiome between the different feeding groups. So that's an interesting finding. Um, if you've heard me talk about the microbiome before, I always sort of throw skepticism at these diversity measures because I think they are a very simplified way of scoring the microbiome. Um, and we don't know at this point what that means. So a baby eating meat has higher microbiome diversity. Is 
that good or is it bad? Um, I don't think we're in a position to say, but we see a difference. Um, another way of looking at microbiome in a sort of big picture way beyond assigning these diversity scores is to do um, these principal component analysis. So here each dot is one infant and they're colored according to their feeding group. Um, and the closer two dots are in space means the more similar their microbiome community is. So sometimes if you look at a plot like this, if I was to show you, um, say, adults with IBD and healthy adults, you'd see them clustering into two kind of distinct groups because they have very different microbiomes. And I think what you can appreciate here is the colors are all mixed together and there's no clear clustering of the different diet groups. Um, so that's surprising or maybe not, um, but we don't see a major clustering of the different meat groups when we look at the microbiome this way. And you can visually look at that and you can also quantify it with a technique <coughs> called permanova or permutational multivariate analysis of variance. Um, and essentially the stats show that there's also no difference. Um, another way to look at microbiome um, is, uh, this is called a uh, analysis, uh, least effects squares analysis of different things. Um, and so each node is a group of bacteria. And what this method does is you tell it your groups of infants and then it will highlight any groups of bacteria that are different. So here I'm showing you cesarean delivered infants versus vaginal, because that's one sort of factor that we know influences the microbiome. So it's using the same data set. I wanted to see that sort of, I'm seeing the expected patterns. And then one thing that I've seen in the child study that you may have heard me present on before and that other groups have shown in babies in the gut microbiome um, is that there is a depletion of bacteria in babies in infants delivered by cesarean section. And I've seen that in this group, even though there were very many disease section babies. Um, but it's showing in green, so bacteroides are more prevalent in the vaginal uh, delivered infants, or another way of saying they're depleted in cesarean. So that sort of gives me confidence that I've seen patterns I expect in the data. Um, but when I did this again and grouped by diet, um, not a lot is coming up um, in terms of the three feeding groups. So there's a few um, groups of bacteria that are coming up as different, but um, I don't know this very warm but here. LDA is the effect size and it's set up to, um, and then a p-value of 0.05. So these are significant differences. If I ran that with feeding groups, absolutely nothing would light up. Um, so I lowered the effect size to one, and I made the p-value 0.1. So these are now just trends that we're looking at, uh, but I wanted to kind of see what would pop up. So sort of maybe some clues. Maybe if we have a larger sample size, these differences would be significant. But so far, really just kind of trends. Um, so this was looking just at after weaning or after introduction of foods, the three groups. Um, but then I looked at each group separately and compared before and after introduction of solid foods to see maybe that way I would find um, differences. And so you'll see that in each feeding group, there's a few different bugs lighting up um, on this wheel. But again, I had to dial down the effect size of the p value to get at these trends. Um, so we're still kind of digging around to see if, um, if any of these might have new but so far it's just kind of exploratory. Um, and the final slide I'll show you with microbiome data is just really an example of another method we can use um, to identify types of bacteria. <coughs> um, so this, I like the name of this, called the volcano flood. It's like a volcano flood. Um, but it's looking in two ways at comparing um, bacteria. So the fold enrichment, or how much they increase or decrease in a particular group. Um, and also just comparing it uh, relative abundance. So the ones in these quadrants that are colored in pink are, are the ones that are the most different between groups. So this is one example showing the serial versus the serial plus group group, and sort of the different stacks that are the most um, discriminatory between the groups. So there are all sort of different ways of addressing the microbiome differences, and we have to kind of wade through those to see if we find um, something meaningful. As James has been talking today, I've been scribbling notes on other things we should check. So, for example, there are these differences in iron. So maybe looking at are there certain microbes that are associated with the babies with the highest or lowest levels of iron. Um, many things we can kind of explore to tie all these together potentially. I think right now, kind of the conclusion on the microbiome side is that we see these differences in overall diversity, uh, but so far we haven't been able to identify specific species or groups of bacteria. Uh, it intrigues me that, uh, that uh, <coughs> the 
with more diversity than we grew. I started thinking about that. What does it, how does that all that mean? I mean, we are closer in composition to meat than we are cereal. So maybe it was breastfed getting meat, is getting a food that is closer in composition to breast milk and cereal. If you look at, if you bring down the nutrients, the macronutrient content, protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamins, minerals, so forth and so on. Meat is, is closer to breast milk than is cereal. Um, so there's more diversity. I would have thought if you were eating something close to what you already were getting for six months, that there'd be less diversity because it would be just like take the next step. So is it really, I don't know, I don't know how to interpret it. Um, I have to assume, I, I, I like the fact that Megan found differences in vaginal uh, versus cesarean, because it, sh it, it, it shows that the data that follows patterns we already saw. So I would like to think that what we found has some meaning. I don't know what it is. And the reason I asked Megan to talk was because when I saw this, I thought it was a floor plan for the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> so some noteworthy notes about the study. Winnipeg is just flooring with people all the time, as you know. Uh, my wife tells me every day that she's the only white person on the bus going up to St. Norbert's downtown. And when we first came here in 2002, she was the majority, the ruling majority. But anyway, so lots of new people moving to Winnipeg, and God bless them, because they saved Toronto, and in Toronto it was all white. It was going down the fast, and the whole world moved in, Place it is today. So I'm hoping the winner thing could be converted to. Uh, that's not a side, that's probably the comment that I kept to myself. 20% of the people who are using probiotics. So one of the female babies is probiotics. Prenatal uh, vitamins, some, some other introduced formula. It's hard not to introduce formula. Uh, I watched my daughter uh, breastfeed from the from the first day in the hospital, and the hospital did not support her at all. Her husband didn't support her at all. He said, come on, it's too hard to give the form. And I, I saw the whole thing floored me, because this, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and academically, and then I have it happen in real life. It's a challenge for us to be, you know, it's, it's, you ought to be a hero. Uh, what foods did people feed? Carrots, peas, do you know, after that? <coughs> Meat, no one's eating meat. Well, there's still are feeding their babies meat. Yeah. yeah. So, conclusions. There is greater unabsorbed value if you got a bit of said cereal. Now you know. It absorbs the water from cereal is about 5%. The rest goes and sits in the cold. That's like a lab. When you figure out the lab, that's what we do. You get a test tube, we put iron in it. So, why, why do we expect something like that? Cereal uh, plus food appears to increase inflammation. I have no idea why. I don't guess. Um, microbiome changes between the different feed groups are subtle, not major. So that's my conclusion. This may or may not be me when I was young. <laughs> and this is part of the group uh, that I thought was over study. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. What was the relative sugar content in the cereal with and without fruit? Is it the same or comparable? Good question. I don't know. Hmm? I don't know. But I'll look it up. I'm just curious about that in the Yeah. Sugar. Or what type it was. That sugar. Protein? I mean, just intuitively, it might be higher in the cereal with this fruit. Oh, I see. I see. Because of the sugar in the raspberries. Oh. But that would be interesting if it was sugar that was a culprit, not fruit at all. Yes. So was it always the same fruit, too? Yes. Yeah. cereal is the same. OK. Yeah. And my other question was about controlling for the probiotics that the babies, that 20% of the babies were fed. Is there any way you can control for 
Well, we can flash it. Yeah, I mean, what's that partial? You can, yeah, you, you can. But what I, you're right, because I, We're looking at those as two groups. Yeah. Things that work better yeah. for biology versus sure. not. Yeah. Yeah. Was it dry right? proof that people served? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What proof was it? Dry proof. But that may be a proxy for sugar. I mean, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know sugar is doing a lot of damage to all of us. Apparently. So I want to similar lines to that, the sugar and question. Yeah. I'd love to see the study that again with home prepared food. Because you, you talked about the sulfites and preservatives and sugar, you know, a lot of those yeah. other things. And I think a lot of moms um, choose to prepare their own food, A, because it's cheaper. And because it doesn't have all of that extra stuff. So it'd be interesting to see what changes uh, home food versus store-bought food. Yeah. Uh, let me say, uh, we went with the market. Most women, as far as I know, yeah, that's a hard one to do. There were several women who fed, when we put them in the meat group, they fed their babies moose because that's what their husbands had killed the week before. So I was, I was aware, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, I, uh, yeah. These are point. just other trends, right? Yeah. Like not everybody's. Uh, what percentage of women do they show? On that, I have no idea. I was around with way different than women other people hang around with, and people do it for different reasons. No, so yeah. Some will do it because it is more yeah. more cost effective. Yeah. You just grind up what you're eating at supper, and then yeah. other people do it because it, you know, you're going organic or you're going trendy. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Or it could be white question. Um, I guess from a knowledge translation perspective, um, how do we how do we communicate this? Because as a mom, I was in between that shift in recommendations. My first baby, four pounds, recommended cereal. You, know, you do it that way because that's what you're following the guidelines. Next baby, meats first, and it's like, okay, we'll do meat first. Um, so you know, how do you how do you balance that? And then you have evidence about other changes and. Um, how do you translate these kind of findings so that moms don't just look at it and say, forget it. I'm not going to follow any recommendations. We're just going to, you guys keep changing your mind. Um, and that's why I did the study. Yeah. I took the recommendation as it. What, what happens? That's exactly why I did the study. Mm -hmm. We got our, our daughter, Baby Bullet. She was on our food. She's vegetarian. And I would understand why mothers would want to feed their babies totally clean, non-pesticide, non hormone non non-steroid, non-anything. For the first year of life, they set them up. Once they hit, once they hit pizza plus over there, we're off. There's nothing you can do, but you can spend the first year clean as, as, as you can. And that's when we feel, that's when we're closest to each other as our infants and so on. I, I see what you're saying. What I did was what the market, what, what the market told me to do. If I had money, more money. Yeah, you did it. Again. Lovely to design study. Nice. Would be lovely. Uh, I was uh, just going to ask about the meat and if there was like you're just saying, you know, hormones and all that. And as a mother as well, I, f I feel like feeding my child. I mean, there's really poor quality meat out there, and feeding your baby, you know, beef that's who knows what's in it as the first food. And I wonder if there will be consequences down the road for that type of thing as well. Of course. Well, that's why I said, you know, look, Walter Willett, who's our hero, he's a godfather, godfather from, <coughs> from uh, Harvard, says, don't go don't near processed meat ever, period, and cut down the rest. He's got the physician's heart health survey, the nurse's survey, he's, he's, he, he knows more about the nurse than anybody alive. He's got all the data. And that's what he said. So if he's saying that, why are we being Okay. I still don't get it. Are there not cultures in the non-Western world who do feed their babies meat as a first food that you could sort of use I as about that. Most in a cross-sectional comparison? Yeah, it's a good idea. I'm not sure who. 
I'm not sure who, who either, but I feel like when I had my babies, people told me that some people in the world had their babies meet first. And so then I heard of this, and I haven't pursued it, but... Um, what if you do, let me know. <laughs> yeah, 65% of the world is vegetarian. So most babies are fed plant food first. I've gotten that. But you're right, cost of the parents is great. Right, so that was a question that in that other cultural group, they're not going to be using commercial commercial infant cereal, they're probably using the and things like that as a protein source. Yeah. So what they really need to do is study like that to see how the microbiome is affected the seed. Our fo the focus um, in Canada and the US and the WHO is not iron. It's not about meat or service, but iron. How do we get babies iron when their stores are virtually run out? And iron is a weird nutrient. It's the only nutrient of all the nutrients that are essential, of all the nutrients that are essential that we allow stores to run out. We literally allow babies to deplete their stores to zero and then we feed them. You would never do that in an animal or a shot. You would never let their P12 or the thymine or any of those essential nutrients run up to zero and then fix it. But we do it with babies. And it reflects how little we know about iron. It's just a strange dude. Very, very strange. Yes? The zinc question, because, you know, when I used to do outpatient feeds and the meat stuff came out then, and I, you know, Part of the zinc, is zinc a reason to feed meat, or is it really not a reason? Is it not a good reason? It's a good source of, 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 of uh, zinc. Uh, zinc is easier to obtain from other foods than iron is. Iron is terrible. I mean, Popeye, right? When you have know, spinach, I mean, there's spinach is low iron. You don't absorb any. It's trapped all the spinach molecules, and they won't let it go. So you know. If you're vegetarian, you know, which my daughter is, and her friends, so we, we discuss this all the time, and I see them anemic, and they have to go and get iron shops, and the whole shoot match. Iron for, is very difficult in our culture to do right, and you're vegetarian, it's a real challenge. You've got to be really good keep an eye on that. Yes? I'm just wondering how you're defining exclusive breastfeeding. Is that simply mean no solids and no formula? Or does it mean no vitamin D supplements, no infant time, and all, all of that good stuff? Because we know those things do affect the infant gut as well, in terms of microbiome. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a funny definition. I mean, exclusive breastfeeding, I think the WHO definition is exclusive breastfeeding, you give vitamin D is okay, no water, you should get enough of breast milk. And in the US, the iron drops in four months, still considered exclusive breastfeeding. So it's, it's, a, it's an academic definition. What we meant was that their primary food was breast milk. We would allow them a couple of, a couple of 100 mils or 75 mils of formula. Uh, because, again, this is, this is the thing about rats, and mice, monkeys. They do what you tell you, and once they've done what you told them to do, you kill them. You know? <laughs> we just can't do that with this kind of study. The ethics is all up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember when I was nursing my babies, and way back in my master's days, which is like a hundred years ago, but um, I remember reading that just one introduction of formula, like it, that it drastically changes an infant's gut flora, and it takes 14 days of exclusive breastfeeding to return that gut to a, that of breastfed baby's gut. Wow. So one thing I did do, because um, what I saw read is that some infants have received formula. <laughs> Um, was first to check if that was any different across their groups, and it was that there was a few nutrients that received it. But I repeated the microbiome analyses, at least excluding any of the infants that received a bit of formula, um, and the patterns were still the same. I also tried it excluding the C-section babies, because there were only a few of them, and still not the same. But the trouble is, when your groups are you know, 20 in each group, and then you have three that were C-section, and three that were formula, and then you just end up with a really small group. So um, what you said is, 
stop folks from doing what they're going to do, right? So we do the best we can, and I tried to kind of exclude those and see if it was really driving any differences, and it doesn't seem to be. Um, but there were different ones that need to be considered. And the, the fun thing about these studies is these are real women, real babies, real poop, real pee. <laughs> this is the real world. You know, I, I, I decided long ago in my career, I was going to study it. That's where the answers were. If I was in the USDA in Grand Forks, in the metabolic unit, we'd say, have, we'd have the mothers in the bin, we'd have them feed exactly the babies that we had put in front of them, and it would be a totally unreal study, but it, but it, would, it would be cleaner. You would, need, you would need less people to see significant differences. And that's why my colleagues do animal studies. So now we, yeah, so anyway, but I like what we found, I don't know what it means, I don't understand the fruit. I, uh, I don't understand the diversity of the meat group. I don't, I don't understand. I don't have a clue. Mega doesn't need it. Otherwise, she would have said I don't think. You know, so that, that's, to me, is fantastic. So it just means, wow, well, if something's happening, you know, why? What does it mean? You know, are these bacteria different? Well, so what? What does this bacteria do? Does it alter diabetes? Does it program you for heart disease? Does it stop you from getting cancer? That's the next step in all this microbiome stuff is what these guys actually do. When you have a difference, what do they do? That's that's the real exciting part. So we're, we're sort of in the rush to find out what's going on. <laughs> Any more questions? Any answers? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>